Okay, so we'll start another section, and this section will be held by Professor uh, Cid Araújo. Uh, it's a pleasure, actually, to introduce him. It's difficult to introduce him because uh, he has so many distinguished uh, prizes, etc. But uh, Professor Cid uh, was graduated by University of Pernambuco in electrical engineer, and then he did his PhD and master's at PUC in physics. And then he went to a postdoc at Harvard. Um, Professor Sid then went back to the University of Pernambuco and is now a full professor at the University of Pernambuco for more than 15, uh, I think 17 years. Huh? And um, it's actually an honor to, to introduce him because he was on my uh, committee for uh, uh, being at, uh, uh, at the University of Campinas. He was the the head of committee when I was uh, being tested to be a professor here. So it's an honor to, to have him here, and uh, uh, I'm sure that you guys will enjoy his talks. Thank you, Professor. How do you turn the laser on? This is the USB. Well, Tiago, thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as you probably remember, this school is joint with the Svieca School, which is a school which is uh, held by the Brazilian Physical Society for about 30 years now. And uh, I participate in this school uh, for 14 times. So it's a, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. So. Uh, the title of my talk is this one, High Order Nonlinearities. So in some way, it will be a continuation of the first class uh, presented by Paulo yesterday. So a little bit about my city. That's, it's not so cold as in here, there. So we are nearby the beach. It's an old seat for the Brazilian standards. So it's about uh, 400 and almost 500 years. And it has about 1.7 million inhabitants. Well, so the plan of the course is this. In the first talk, I'm going to tell you something about these high order optical nonlinearities. In the second talk, I will make several applications of the, the things that I present today. And uh, in the third, third class, I will talk about propagation of light, stimulated emission, multi absorption in different disordered medium. So let me start with the first nonlinear optics paper published in 1961 by this group at uh, Michigan University. And that's the, the effect that was discussed yesterday by Paulo. That's the second ammonic generation. You come with a beam with a frequency omega, and then you get two omega. If you adjust the direction of propagation of the beam through a crystal in order to have phase matching. So you have uh, energy conservation in the process. It's not necessary to be in resonance with an excited state. That's a parametric effect. And uh, uh, you have to, to have this uh, conservation of momentum. So. Uh, when these people did this experiment, it was not very clear for them that they were initiating a new field. Uh, they even did not know that it was necessary to have a crystal to have this uh, experiment going on. I heard from the, one of the authors, this one here, that the first proposal of Peter Franken was to use a piece of glass to, to do this experiment. And, uh, the, the contribution of this guy for this experiment was just say him that use a piece of quartz. That's all he did for the experiment. And that was essential for the experiment. Okay. So uh, as Paulo discussed yesterday, uh, a way to describe the effect of a high intense field on an atom is treating the atom as a, an ammonic oscillator. So if you have a field which can be comparable of the internal field of atom, instead of having a harmonic oscillator, if you produce a change in the position of equilibrium of the electron 
to be far from the uh, equilibrium position, instead of having a harmonic oscillator, you have to, to consider an unharmonic oscillator. And then the energy of the electron in this atom, you should add some terms which uh, describes this anamonicity. And then you have this restoring force, which was commented yesterday. So instead of having a linear force, we should have, we may have a quadratic, cubic, etc. terms in here. So in a classical approximation, what we have to do is to solve this equation based on little, uh, Newton's law, calculate the polarization which is induced in the system, and is the dust of atoms that you have in your sample, and then you come with this expression where you have the several polarizations which depends on different powers of the electric field which is present. Uh, yesterday, Paulo commented about P1, P2, P3. Today, I'll, call, I'll talk about P3 and the rest, okay? Uh, so, just to remember what you saw yesterday, in the case of second harmonic generation, since the polarization is quadratic with the electric field, if you have a like, field with a frequency omega, when you uh, calculate the quadratic of this, then you come with this uh, two omega frequency. If you have a field with two different frequencies, then you may have a polarization which depends of the uh, frequency like that. Then we have a, a ratification, optical ratification, that does not depend on the frequency. You may have the second harmonic here, uh, some frequency generation. If you have two different frequencies, you generate a frequency which is a sum of the incident one, and then you have the different frequency generation. I'm going to present some uh, examples of this in the uh, lecture tomorrow. Uh, if you consider the chi three uh, susceptibility, then you may have this uh, kind of uh, four wave mixing process in which uh, you may mix three different fields to generate the signal. Again, you don't have a population involved, so you have a parametric process, and then you may have a process like that or like that, or other combinations that are possible. One simple way to, to, to describe this effect is just thinking in terms of uh, interference between two uh, plane waves. So if you have two plane waves uh, incident on a sample, then you have a grating, <laughs> And uh, if you use, uh, for example, pulsed lasers, the front of the pulse creates this grating, and the back of the pulse uh, diffracts in the grating. So you have a kind of self-diffraction uh, process, which is illustrated in here. That's a slide that I took from Bob Boyd, who presented in the school, Svieck School, in 2004. It was in uh, another state here. So that's uh, what happens. You come with two beams, adjust the appropriate angle between them, and then you generate two other beams with uh, directions which satisfies the phase matching condition. Another effect which is described by chi, chi 3 is the self-focusing. Uh, that's due to the uh, chi 3 real part of chi 3 which is proportional to the refractive index, nonlinear refractive index. Assuming that we have a Gaussian beam, and uh, this Gaussian beam will modify the refractive index via chi 3 in such a way that uh, we have a first correction for the refractive index, which is proportional to the intensity. So if we have a Gaussian beam incident in a sample, then you have the refractive index modified in such a way. If any two can be positive or negative, if any two is positive. So it means that the beam passing through a sample like that, parallel faces, uh, it uh, is focused in some distance here, which depends on the intensity of the beam. So uh, if you come with a Gaussian profile, for example, in here, then you have a any two positive, for example, the sample will behave like a biconvex, biconvex or biconvex, I don't know, uh, lens. Okay. The origin of this process, there are several different uh, mechanisms. In, in this uh, series of lectures, 
I'll be interested only in the electronic polarization. In this case, N2 is typically varied between 10 to minus 16 to 10 to minus 13, and the response time is about order of femtosecond. Other mechanisms are, uh, can be even stronger, like in the term effects, but the response time is very, very long. So, when I, I, I will present here some results of measuring N2, so I'm talking about change in the refractive index, which uh, is given by this. Uh, and if I have a, a pulse with a one gigawatt per square centimeter, it corresponds to measure change in the refractive index by 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 4. So very small change produced in the refractive index. Everything was uh, everything that we do in this kind of nonlinear optics, that's no relativistic nonlinear optics, was uh, uh, discussed a long time ago in 1962 by Nicholas Blomberg and uh, collaborators at that time. And uh, uh, the Bible of the field is this book here, which is quite hard to read, but that's the Bible. Okay. Ron Shen, it was mentioned before, ah, he is not here, but he is uh, one of the first collaborators in this area, was a student of uh, Nicholas Blomberg, and so they, they did a lot of work at this time. So if the material, if the system that I'm uh, interested in does not present inversion symmetry, all the even order susceptibilities are known, there is no second harmonic, no fourth harmonic, and uh, I can write the total polarization as, like in here, a uh, linear polarization plus a uh, nonlinear polarization, which depends on the power of the field like it is in here. So, besides the refractive index of uh, third order, we may talk about nonlinear refractive index of every order. Uh, N4, N6, etc. And also nonlinear absorption coefficients associated to susceptibilities of the different orders. So, uh, what I'm going to discuss here is something uh, uh, looking for these contributions, which can be very important uh, for some uh, systems. So, I'm going to be interested in a refractive index of uh, associated to chi 5, to chi 7. Uh, as well as absorption coefficient corresponding to this uh, order of susceptibility. So there are many effects that we can study. Uh, Multi-wave mixing, for example, you may have uh, several waves incident in a sample, then you may have a, a, a wave which is uh, created with an intensity that's proportional to the square modulus of uh, chi 2 and n plus 1. You may have self-focusing associated to different orders of susceptibilities. You may have multi absorption associated to the different orders. And the light propagation in the medium is described via the uh, Maxwell's equation, where we include this term here, which is associated to the nonlinear polarization. So, what we have to do is just to consider the order of the susceptibility in here in order to describe the propagation of the field in you know, one particular system. And uh, the, the example that I'm going to present now is the propagation of solitons. Uh, solitons are s solutions of the Maxwell's equation with the nonlinear polarization terms uh, put inside the equation. Normally, people call this a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And uh, the solution that's called solid or very special solution, uh, waves that have a special shape such that it propagates in a medium without changing in the profile or small change in the, in the amplitude. When two solitons pass, interact with another, uh, the change that you can observe is a change, the phase in the electric fields that you, you have. There are temporal solitons, spatial solitons, 
people in uh, optic fiber likes to study temporal solitons. So we have here some uh, specialists on that. Today I'm going to talk about the spatial solitons, only spatial solitons. And uh, what I want to, to say is that uh, you may solve the Maxwell's equation. And then you come with this special solution that propagates without change. But physically, it uh, corresponds to, to the following. When you propagate the light beam, you have the diffraction of the beam, like light from a, a flash lamp. So the beam, while it propagates, it gets broader. If you have this, uh, the medium is a nonlinear medium, then you have this uh, uh, self-focusing effect. Self-focusing effect contributes to focus the beam if the refractive index is positive. So if you find the correct intensity in order to compensate the two effects, then you have the bright spatial solitons. That means the beam which propagates without suffer this diffraction. So I'm interested in this kind of uh, system, this kind of process. In order to see how it comes from mathematics, from mathematics, uh, we can solve this uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, if you consider only one dimension, transverse dimension, so you have the beam propagated along the z direction and, and the field oscillating along the y direction, for example, then the Maxwell's equation assumes this form here if I consider the field described in this way, where this AXZ gives uh, the profile of the beam. So this term here is due to the chi tree contribution. So you have here uh, proportional to the uh, a, cube, a cube term with the electric field. And uh, if you make an approximation for this equation, uh, considering that the change the, the second derivative with respect to z uh, satisfies this, is much smaller than this, then I can uh, write this equation here. For this equation, there is a solution. A solution is given in terms of a hyperbolic second. And uh, that's the solid solution. So it means that you may propagate a hyperbolic second, sec second hyperbolic, and then it propagates without change. But that's a solid for one dimension. That's a very old story. Uh, people uh, demonstrate this effect a long time ago. This uh, French group, they did the following experiment. They took CS2, which is a liquid, nonlinear liquid, and uh, make a beam with this profile here, just uh, like a rod with a cylindrical lens, and propagate it in a liquid. So uh, by change, the power of the instant beam, they come from this profile to this one here. So it means that for low power, the beam spreads when it, it passes through the liquid. But for some particular power, you get exactly the shape that you have in there. A uh, few years later, they demonstrate that they could repeat this kind of experiments with the planar waveguides. So they took two quartz plates, put CS2 in here, and did the same kind of experiment. Look for the uh, profile of the beam. This experiment was done with the picosecond lasers in the green. So that's an example for 1 plus 1 D solito. That means one transverse dimension propagating along the Z direction. But uh, you can be uh, you can be interested in look for the 2 plus 1 D solid. That means consider the two transverse directions, X and Y, propagate along Z, and then Maxwell's equation is like that. The problem with this uh, equation is that uh, the solution that you get from here is not stable. You can find it mathematically. Just assume that there is a small change in the intensity. Then you see that you cannot compensate diffraction and self-focusing. So it means that, for example, suppose that the, the laser intensity fluctuates a little bit, increase a little bit, so the self-focusing dominates the diffraction, and so the intensity can be very strong. 
can be very strong and the beam is uh, focused in such a way that you may destroy, for example, your medium. And that's called catastrophe self-focusing. So this effect uh, was uh, studied a long time ago, in the 60s. And people describe, uh, look for different ways to compensate for that. So they start looking for different materials with uh, uh, some birefringence, for example, look for thermal effects in order to compensate that. But uh, the pure electronic effect was not studied up to recently. So in order to compensate this instability in this uh, Maxwell's equation, is to consider, for example, the contribution of chi phi next to nonlinearity. So you have here this contribution. That's due to chi 3. That's due to chi 5. Any 2 is in here. Any 4 is in here. So if they have, if any 2 is positive and any 4 is negative, so the instability is completely removed from this equation. Uh, so chi 5 may stabilize the, the solution. The problem was that uh, which material would present that? So that was a problem known since uh, about uh, 45 years. And uh, uh, no homogeneous and isotropic material was identified to have this propagation of solitons for uh, long distance. So what I'm going to present here is the first demonstration of this uh, soliton propagating a homogeneous medium with local nonlinearity. I mean, with the electronic local nonlinearity. So that was an experiment that we did uh, three years ago. And uh, for doing that, we used a liquid which is very common for everybody who does nonlinear optics. That's liquid uh, carbon, uh, carbon disulfide, CS2. So what was new in that was that we found that CS2 presents a fifth order susceptibility any 4, which is a negative. Any 2 is positive. Any 4 is negative. So we could have this stabilization. So in order to do this experiment, we work with a beam at this wavelength. This is the absorbance of CS2. You see it's completely transparent in the visible and near infrared. But if you do this absorption experiment, dissolving, for example, CS2 in ethanol. Ethanol corresponds to this red line here. So you see that there is a, an absorption band of CS2 in that position, which corresponds to about 317 nanometers. And that corresponds exactly to the third of this wavelength here. So it means that besides sky tree, by exploiting this third, this third three photo absorption, I'm uh, and hence, the contribution of chi 5. So, in such a way that I may have this uh, compensation to, to cancel the catastrophe uh, that occurred if there is no chi 5. So, you can see here uh, any two positive and four negative that was measured by two other groups. And you can measure the three fold absorption just by doing an experiment where you shine light and measure the transmitted light. That's a kind of optical limiting experiment. So you can, from this fitting here, you can uh, determine the three-fold absorption. So by doing this, we could compensate this catastrophic behavior. So this is the experimental setup. We have an amplified titanium sapphire system, 800 nanometers, 100 femtosecond, 1 kilohertz. We pump uh, OPA. And then we get this uh, wavelength at 920. Uh, the intensity of the beam is controlled by a pair uh, lambda over two plate plus polarizer. That's a, a spatial filter in order to have a Gaussian beam. And then we have the beam incident in this lens. The sample is put in here in the CS2, CS2 in this cell. And here is a, a camera CCD in order to get the profile of the beam. And uh, this is the characterization of the beam. We sh should have a Gaussian beam. And that's not very far from the Gaussian beam. Gaussian beam co would correspond to m squared uh, equal to 1. So that's the beam profile at the position of the lens L3. So the, 
the beam waist was uh, two millimeters. Then we have a reasonable Gaussian beam. And in the focal region, here in the position of this cell, we have this beam with 16 micromet micrometers of uh, beam waste. And here is uh, the, some of the results. We put the beam at the entrance of the cell with 16 micrometers, that's the profile. If we do not put CS2 in the cell, leave the empty cell, then uh, after the position of the cell, the beam now gets uh, broader, about 400 microns, the beam waste. But if we increase the intensity, then you can see that it changed, for example, here for intensity of uh, 0.7, 10 to 15 watts per square meter, then you have this uh, beam waste being reduced. And then we found the correct intensity in order to have this beam propagating without change in the profile. So that's a, a summary of the experiments being done here. So you can see that from this position here, two, two times 10 to 11 watts per square centimeter, the beam propagates uh, without change. That's a very long distance. That's about a, a few millimeters. But few millimeters here corresponds to a, a very long uh, uh, propagation, distance of propagation that corresponds to 10 Rayleigh length for that length of, uh, that is in front of the CS2 cell. So the experiment was done with cells with different uh, length and uh, some uh, numerical uh, treatment of the Maxwell's equation, of the nonlinear linear equation, shows that uh, for the intensity below the intensity of uh, solitons, then you have this, the beam is spreading, while for the intensity 1.6, that's about here, the beam becomes uh, collimated. So that's a spatial soliton. And in this, in this uh, slide here, I show that, uh, we show that uh, the profile, the spectral profile of the beam also changes when we increase the intensity. That's due to the self phase modulation effect that was discussed yesterday by Paulo. So you see that increasing the intensity, the profile, the spectral profile changes, but for some intensity region, like in here, there is a clamping of the intensity, which indicates that the beam is collimated. The intensity of the beam is uh, uh, constant uh, in this interval of intensity. So that's not a real mathematical soliton. That's a, a soliton in an equation where we have this refractive contribution and the absorptive contribution. So it's not a mathematical soliton. Uh, it's not in the sense of the mathemati mathematicians. That's a, a soliton, a real soliton. So in summary, what this experiment shows is that uh, we had a propagation for more than 10 Rayleigh length. That means it's stable for a long, long uh, uh, length. There was this intense clamping that uh, co corroborates this uh, stability. And the computer simulation was uh, reasonable in agreement with the experiment. So that was one kind of solid, bright solid. We start with a Gaussian beam and then we could uh, uh, manipulate the profile. There are other kind of solitons. Solitons associated to, there are some dark solitons, or a more sophisticated dark soliton, a soliton which involves a vortex. You heard this morning uh, in a talk by uh, Philip Russell about this kind of uh, uh, light with angular momentum. That's uh, associated with a kind of uh, electric field, which is a generalization of uh, the beams that we usually uh, work with. Uh, an optical vortex is a beam with a phase singularity. It means a beam uh, that presents zero field in the center of the beam. Uh, the wave front is helical, and uh, the phase of the wave is like that. So if you talk about plane waves, m is equal to 0. But if you have m different of 0, 
Then you have this angular phase that corresponds to this angular momentum that the wave, uh, the wave carries. So that's what's called topological charge of the beam. So the wave front of the beam is like that. So if we have a m equal to zero, then you have a wave plane, a plane wave, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you have m equal to minus one or plus one, then you have a helical. The wave front goes like that. Uh, so you can have a phase that change, for example, from zero to two p, two pi, from uh, zero to four pi, and the intensity profile is like that. So you have a phase that you can uh, manipulate, and then you have the intensity can, that change from Gaussian beam to, ha to have this profile. So we, uh, so, and uh, the, the, the light propagating is like that, okay? We have been playing with this uh, kind of uh, uh, electromagnetic field, and then now we are able to shape the beams with different topological charge. We can make beams with this shape here, and uh, we develop some techniques to characterize these uh, different beams with different profiles, with the different topological charge, etc. And that's made uh, use a, uh, uh, where is it? <laughs> we, we use a SLM, a spatial light modulator, which are uh, made of uh, uh, liquid crystals. So you can manipulate with these beams, so you can find a, a way to have a vortex beams with a different topological charge. So what I'm going to show here is another experiment involving solitons. That's an optical vortex soliton. Here, the thing is different from the case of bright soliton. The stable propagation of an optical vortex soliton is possible in a defocusing medium. Uh, in the case of bright soliton, the, it is stable if you have a focusing medium. And uh, in the case here, the propagation is unstable in a self-focusing medium. So the problem here was what we have to do in order to observe optical vortex soliton stable in a self-focusing medium. And uh, what are the conditions that the nonlinear Schrodinger equation should uh, satisfy in order to have a, a optical vortex soliton in a self-focusing medium? And then with mathematics, you can find that if you have a saturable nonlinear refractive index and nonlinear absorption, it's possible to have this propagation there. So again, CS2. CS2, uh, if you look for uh, transmitters as a function of input intensity, then working in the 532 nanometers, you can find that uh, there is a nonlinear absorption. That's due to three fold absorption. There is some contribution also from four, four fold absorption. But uh, the refractive index, the effective nonlinear refractive index for intensities of the order of, uh, in this region here of 20 gigawatts, 40 gigawatts per square centimeter, it goes like that, the black line. This black line can be fitted by expression like that. Then you have an effective N2, which contains contribution of N4, N6, everything, <laughs> and uh, can be written like that, intensity square divided by one plus B, a factor, a constant, times I square. So we just plug this in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then we, can, uh, we could do this, this experiment. The experiment is done like that. We have the laser beam, in this case, uh, 80, 80 picosecond in the green, then we pass the beam through a vortex phase plate. Instead of using this, the uh, spatial light modulator, we use this vortex phase plate. Vortex phase plate is a plate made of a polymer with a thickness that's changed for different angles along 
that direction perpendicular to the normal to the plate. And then we introduce this phase in the beam. So it means that if you have this Gaussian beam passing through this phase plate, then you get this profile. Then uh, we focus this uh, spatial filter in order to clean the beam, and then we focus this uh, light in a sample, which is again a liquid CS2. And then in order to, to observe the profile, we use a CCD looking for the transmitters for different thickness of samples. And also we observe along the transverse direction, another CCD to see the profile of the beam along the propagation. Okay, so in this case, we use a, a, vort a vortex corresponding to topological charge M equal to one that corresponds to uh, mom angular momentum of H bar per photon. It's much more simple than to use that quite sophisticated uh, fiber that was uh, discussed this morning, that just passed the beam through this uh, plate. Uh, and here are the results. The results here that I'm showing is with a sample with different uh, thickness. For this is the Z equal to zero is a beam focused in the entrance phase of the cell. And then we use a cell with one millimeter, two, three, four, five millimeters. The results in here corresponds to one gigawatt per square centimeter. We cannot observe solitos. You see here that the beam is, becomes larger as it propagates for long distance. However, for larger intensity, 9 gigawatts per square centimeter, we can observe this solid on stable up to 3 millimeters. So it's a vortex solid on stable by propagating by 3 millimeters. And what you see here is uh, experimental results observing the transverse, uh, in the transverse direction, in, this, in the side, side view of the, the, the cell. And uh, you, what you can see here is that for one gigawatt, the beam spreads. Five gigawatts, the beam spreads again. But from eight gigawatts to about uh, 15 gigawatts, there is a, a beam stay, stay collimated for a distance, which is measured here in millimeters. Uh, you can see here that from eight to 10, but it goes up to 15, about that. The beam propagates without change by about three millimeters like it's in here. Using this high intensity, 18 gigawatts per square centimeter, up from this position uh, uh, for Z larger than three, there is an explosion of the beam. The beam is not stable anymore. And what you, what you can see here is the uh, results of the numerical calculation, taking the numbers, corresponds to the experiments. And you can see here that the, the beam radius as a function of position presents regions which, in which it is reasonable stable. That coverage that we are observing uh, optical vortex solid. The equation that's used for that is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation modified in order to have this contribution of the uh, saturated nonlinear refractive index plus the contribution due to uh, uh, nonlinear absorption. So that's the first observation of an uh, optical vortex solid in a medium with local nonlinearity. That's a point that I want to, to remark here. This is a very old story. Solitons, well, in fact, Solitons out of optics were observed in the uh, century 19. It was observed in uh, water. Uh, there are several different kinds of solitons physics. People in uh, high energy physics, they talk about solitons. People in uh, Bose-Einstein condensation talk about solitons. But that's incredible is that a system like CS2 that we have, everybody has in the laboratory, and that's the liquid homogeneous 
no one did, did this experiment before. So that is uh, this uh, demonstration, uh, first demonstration. I have a, a film to, to show you this uh, solid to propagate in uh, water, but I'm not sure if I, I would have uh, time enough to show the film, so I took out from the, from the talk. So if tomorrow I have time in the third talk, I present this film. That's very interesting because then you can, uh, I can talk about the story of the experiment, first experiment made in Ireland. I think it's Ireland, right? By, by Russell, another Russell, no? <laughs> in uh, century, uh, 19th century. So uh, and one thing is that if you take this equation and go beyond this intensity, this soliton is not stable anymore. There is a splitting of the beam. And the splitting of the beam depends very much on the topological charge. Depends on the value of M. And then what happens is this in here. So for a test of uh, 18 gigawatts per square centimeter, the beam splits in two for M equal to one or M equals to minus one. So propagate the vortex, it splits in two. And uh, that's a uh, symmetry breaking that uh, is a problem. So you cannot have this solid for law. In the, in the particular case that we observe, you cannot have it propagated by more than three millimeters. Although three millimeters is a very long distance. And then the solid becomes uh, unstable and uh, uh, the question now is, is it possible to use this kind of uh, uh, instability to do something uh, useful? And that's what I'm going to show you now, is another experiment where we try to control this uh, symmetry breaking. So the experiment was uh, done again with 5.32 nanometers, again with CS2. And in this case, we have two beams is that on the sample. We have one beam which passed through the vortex plate. So we have a vortex beam going like that. And we put a beam split in here in order to have a Gaussian beam. We overlap both beams. And then we have uh, uh, in front of the cell uh, two setups, two configurations. In one configuration, we put the this, this beam, which we call control beam, such that it overlaps with part of the vortex beam. That's the signal beam. And in another experiment, that we overlap in this way here. We found that uh, by doing this, we could control the splitting of the beam after the, the soliton becomes unstable. And those are results. Those results show in the first here, we have this uh, uh, configuration. So the beam, the control beam is not in the center of the vortex beam. And uh, we, the vortex beam is, uh, has an intensity of 18 gigawatts per square centimeter. And we could change the intensity of the control beam from uh, in a certain range. The length of the cell was 10 millimeters. And what you can see here is that by changing the intensity of the control beam, we could uh, change the direction where the two beams uh, appear after the breaking of the symmetry. So you can see that by increasing the intensity, you can rotate the two beams that happens after this uh, symmetry breaking. So, and what is interesting here is that this control beam is, has an intensity which is smaller than the vortex beam. So this is a kind of, uh, and I would not say a transistor because transistor user normally you require some amplification, right? But that's a control of a strong uh, beam by a weaker beam. That's not usual. Normally, you have the opposite. 
And so if you want to make a modulator here, so you can just put uh, at the side, at the exit of the cell, you can put a eyes, and then you shine your control beam. Then you can rotate the thing. In the other case, this case here, it's more, it's more interesting because uh, again we are dealing with uh, intensities which are smaller than the soliton, the vortex beam. But in this case, we could uh, uh, induce energy transfer between the two beams. So in such a way that we could uh, uh, make a zero of one of the beams, transfer all energy to the other beam. Uh, this experiment was not done before. And uh, again, this is the first demonstration of this kind of uh, effect there. Uh, you can uh, describe mathematically this experiment. Again, nonlinear Schrodinger equation with the appropriate terms, using that uh, equation that I, I have shown before, but now with a, a beam, which is a sum of the control beam and the signal beam. And then you can reproduce this result. Uh, I will not show it here because of time, but uh, in the reference that I, I, I put in here before, is this one here, you can find this uh, description, mathematical description. Uh, so, you can see that by exploiting this high order electronic nonlinearity, we could do this uh, kind of experiment. In this case, we did not go very far, just the chi 5. Okay? Just chi 5 was where chi 3 and chi 5 were exploited to, to observe this effect. So, it was possible to, to observe. For the first time, these bright spatial solitons in a homogeneous medium with local nonlinearity. It was possible to observe the stable propagation of optical vortex solitons in a medium with saturable refractive index. And it was possible to control, in some way, the instability of the OVS. So again, it's a new result for an old problem with a very old material. CS2 is uh, the most... Uh, uh, old material, everybody uh, who studied optics since 1961 used CS2. So, uh, I think that I should pass this. Ooh. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that I'm going uh, to finish here. I, uh, before finishing, I would like to say that uh, one uh, possible way to continue this kind of uh, experiments is look what happens with other liquids. Uh, the thing was that people did not study this in the past because they use a nanosecond laser that has large energy. But if you work with a picosecond laser or femtosecond laser, then you can uh, use a larger power for liquids. And uh, uh, just to, to finish my, my talk, I think that I have only five minutes now. Is that? Uh, I want to mention that it's possible to observe that also in water. In water, you can see these uh, optical nonlinearities of third and fifth order, uh, either in the green or in the infrared. I will not uh, describe details of this experiment. Uh, just uh, remi remember the joke during the lunch time. We also did uh, this uh, with toluene, which is another, another material. So in principle, you can uh, observe this kind of effect in several of these liquids, which, which are a kind of standard for nonlinear optics. Those liquids were studied by many people. Then you can have uh, uh, numbers uh, related to refractive index, absorption, etc. That, that you can use to study different materials from different uh, origins, glasses or polymers, and uh, it's possible there. Uh, if uh, I have some description of this in this uh, review paper that uh, was uh, published a few, few months ago, and then if you want to take a look, there are several techniques that can be used for characterization of materials. So I think that this is my last my last picture. I would have time to show the film, but now it's too late. So 
maybe tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I will show the film. Okay? So thank you very much for your attention. We and have again, you have a lot of time to... Yeah, we have a couple of times for, uh, for questions. Yes, sir. Uh, just a second. Wait for the microphone. You said that you are using control beam to uh, increase the lifetime of the soliton so that it doesn't split or to avoid the symmetry breaking. So uh, uh, earlier you observed it to last for three millimeters. So how much did it increase after using the control beam? How much what? Uh, how much did the distance increase after using the control beam? Ah, the, the experiments were done with, experiment, with the cells of five millimeters to 10 millimeters. So the, the, the results that I show here, I have shown here, I think it was with cells of two millimeters long, but you can go uh, farther from that. So uh, it depends very much on the intensity that you have in the, your signal beam, in your vortex. So if I reduce a little bit the intensity of the uh, vortex beam, I can go further controlling that. And how do you decide the intensity of the control beam that you want to use? Uh, that was uh, empirically. <laughs> empirically. Yeah. That's Thank impossible you. to. But what is interesting is that the intensity of the control beam is much less than the, the strong beam. So that's a kind of a transistor or almost transistor, I don't know. It is a transistor. Mm -hmm. There is one. one more question. Uh, professor, I would like to know if a material presents third order and fifth order nonlinearities, uh, it will necessarily form a vortex. If I can propagate a vortex solid on that? Yeah, that's the question. Because, uh, but I was working actually with glasses, and it presents both nonlinearities. Yeah, uh, look, in, a, in about one hour, I will talk about this. <laughs> because, okay, yeah, okay. because there will be a, a lecture now by Vanellie Bagnato, after that, I will talk again. So I'm going to show examples of that. Mm -hmm. We have been playing with this. Uh, uh, metal dielectric nanocomposites. And by playing with the concentration of metal particles inside the composite, then we can do a lot of things that will answer your question. Um, you um, give us the absorption spectrum of carbon sulfide. And how can you realize it was a three photon absorption? And how can you measure? And it was a homogeneous triphoron absorption or a heterogeneous one? CS2 is a liquid, so it's completely homogeneous. Okay? And uh, in order to have that absorption spectrum, we have to dilute it very much because the, the, the absorption in the, in the UV is quite strong. You will not observe the, those things. The bands above, uh, for wavelength shorter than 300, uh, there is no uh, calculation predicting these bands, but you can find a calculation for uh, gas, CS2 gas. Then you can uh, find the position. That was what we did. We looked for the gas, and then we saw that there should be some uh, band in that region, then we looked for that. That was uh, very simple. Okay, and the three forums absorb where the the same energy, each one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just how, one beam. How can you do uh, to know that? Uh, looking for the behavior of the transmitters as a function of intensity. Uh, I don't know if I, maybe I can put... Uh, you can write the equation for the change of intensity uh, as a function of the incident intensity. 
And then you come with this, uh, if you neglect two photoabsorption, consider only three photoabsorption, just d i d z equal to minus alpha zero times i minus the contribution of three photo, then you solve the equation, then you have this. And then you have, uh, what we have here is just a fitting of this expression. Uh, the parameter that we don't know is this uh, three photo absorption, that the fitting was for that. So that was the measurement. Okay, thank you. I actually have a question. <laughs> uh, why use 920 on the meter and not 780 directly? Because of this. If I use a 78, so by two, with two photo, I would have two photo absorption. I see. I Just don't because want to, to be... To, I want to increase the contribution of chi 5. I see. And that's the reason because I look for this resonance in three photo absorption. Okay. One more. It's quite... Yeah. Can you say something about the prospects for um, three plus one dimensional solitons? There are some experiments in the literature. In this case, I look for experiments that people did not do before. But this, uh, this thing of light bullets, yeah. there are a few experiments. There is a guy called Frank Weiss from, uh, from US. Yeah. Yeah. He did a lot of these uh, uh, light bullets with uh, glasses. I think that here is, in principle, is possible, but uh, we did not try because we are looking for the new effect, the new old effect. Yeah, okay? okay, but maybe it's possible. Yeah, the thing of light bullet is a very hot subject, right? Uh, I didn't understand one thing about the measurements. The solid only exists only inside the sample, which yes. has no linearity, mm -hmm. linearity. But the CCG camera is placed after the sample by a certain distance. Isn't there diffraction? Yeah, you put some what, uh, some uh, optics, some lenses, in order to make the image of the object, which is the uh, XT face of the cell. Okay, you put a lens here, calculate this lens in order to have the image in a in your in the plane of the camera. So that's the way to do. It. Thank you. Okay. No more questions? Well, if, if there is no more questions, so in about one hour, I come here <laughs> again. Okay? Thank you very much for the Thank question. You.